Tommy, thanks for joining me on the Creative Souls of Clare podcast. Can you talk to me a little bit about where you're beaming in from and what the landscape is around you and how life is what you do? Oh, I'm out in, uh, hi, Rory. I'm out in, I'm out in the, the hills of East Clare. I'm, I, live, I live up in the hills outside between Fecal and Tulla. So I'm on a, on a, on a, on a few acres out here. It's, uh, it's a nice, quiet spot. It's quite a different landscape altogether, isn't it? You know. I, oh yeah, very much so. Very different from West Clare. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And do you do you have that sense of the disconnect, or do you I mean do you align more with the Midlands? There, I'm kind of always fascinated by county boundaries and divisions and borders, but it definitely there's this there's a distinct kind of East West Clare thing going on. Well, very much so. Very much so. Even in the music, very much. So. Well, I'm not from Clare originally. I'm from Limerick originally. Yeah. So, uh, but I've been in Clare now. I got my green card oh, about thirty-five years ago, I suppose. And do you do you have to keep renewing that annually? Or how does that <laughs> oh, absolutely. Work? Yeah. I have to go for a, I have to go for at least yeah. one session in a pub a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you've earned your stripes at this stage. Can you talk to me a little bit about those early days when you did arrive in Clare and how how that came about? Um, gosh, I started off in the in the in the, geez, in the seventies coming up to actually a lot, quite a bit of time in the field. There was a gang of us in Limerick playing music together. And we used to, we used to rent one of the rent and Irish cottages, you know, those touch things that they had, they had, they had going. And there was one, there was a bunch of outside faithful. So we used to rent an eight bedroom one, the biggest one they'd have, and there'd be about 35 of us in it. And we'd come up and we'd spend three or four days hanging around in, 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 in Lena's playing tunes and meeting all the locals, you know? So yeah, that would, that would be my, my earliest, Connections with Clare, and then obviously Stockton's Wing after that. Yeah, that'd be in the late seventies. So I was I spent a lot of time in Ennis. Um, that that really conjures up an image of the glory days for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was it was it was very exciting. It was very very exciting times, you know, because I mean there was there was stuff happening in Irish music that had never really happened before. So you know, kind of the the imagination to think that you could actually make a living playing Irish music, you know, that was, that, that was unheard of in those days. You know, there was only two or three bands on the world, you know, in the world who would, who would be making a living out playing Irish music. And the fact that we were able to do it as well was, it was quite extraordinary for all of us. Mm. Each working in a factory. Was there a distinct air of that, like a consciousness that it was a, like a cultural revival or a renaissance? Was that in the air or were you just too busy being in it? I think we were too busy being in it. We were just caught up in it. It, it was it was amazing, you know. The, the uh, I mean, I don't want to be an old fella harking back to the glory days, but at the same time, it was it was quite a scene. I mean, going going to a festival and you know the likes of Planksty and Paul Brady and the Don and all those all those amazing the Body Band first uh, you know first time I ever saw the Body Band. Actually, the first gig I ever did was I played support to the Body Band in Limerick. With a, an accordion player from Innes, yeah, um, yeah. It was, it was, it was quite, it was quite extraordinary. It was quite revolutionary, really. What do you think were the the seeds of brought that about, Tommy? Was it just the the time, the place, the people all coming together at once? I think, yeah, I think it was. You know, the way these things, you know, these a lot of things often happen coincidentally in the world. You know, things things kind of happen. You know, two or three people have the same have the same idea, or, or, or yeah, things do happen like that. It's it's quite extraordinary, but things do happen like that. And I I've, I think at the time it was just it was all coming together, and there was I suppose I suppose you can't really knock cultists for it either, because they were they were providing the space for people to meet up and play. And there's a, you know there's a huge camaraderie in that as well. You know, it just. I, I often, I often, Geraldine Cotter, who's a piano player from Minnesota, often talks about the fact if you meet somebody and you play music with them once or twice, you will never forget them, and they will never forget you. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's there's that there's that connection and that link. You know, so yeah. Is yeah. it is it is it fair to say it, it's it's certainly another form of communication, but is it in some ways a superior form of communication? Oh, most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would say that. I, but yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, let me put on my music therapy hat here. Now. Um, yeah, most. Uh, I mean, I've, I, you know, I work because I've been working as a music therapist now for twenty years. I think close on twenty years, and I work with I work with people who have no means of communication other than music. So, and once you introduce music in, into their realm, you know, they jump on it because they, they they see they see how you can communicate with. Yeah, quite extraordinary, really. Yeah. 
It, it's almost as if, you know, obviously music is such a, a part of culture in so many ways, but it still hasn't landed in terms of the potential that it has to offer. No, I agree. I agree. Well, I mean, the fact, you know, there has been, uh, you know, look at, look, just look in the music therapy since there has been a master's in music therapy in Ireland now for 20, I, I was in the second batch of people. So there's been one for 22 years and we, it still hasn't gotten government recognition as an, as an actual, valid, you know, viable ter therapy, even though <coughs> loads of there's over 150 people working in the country at it and maneuvering ways of getting paid. Yeah, uh, so, you know, so not so much the course, but the actual therapeutic methodology. Is that what you're... Yeah, and, yeah. The benefit, and well, the benefit, you know, the fact that the, the benefit is, is, yeah. is there, it's recognized. You know, when you work, when you work with people, I like, I, I work with a lot of, I work with a lot of kids with autism and I also work in mental health, but having worked for years in autism and kids who were completely nonverbal, yet I'm thinking of one client in particular who can sing every song the Dubliners ever wrote, even though he can't say anything. Yeah, you know, you know, straight away it makes total sense. You know, it, it does, really does. And, and you know, just even at a human level and a compassionate level and an inclusion level, but also at a, even at a financial level, to, to to open up the doors for everyone to to participate. Yes, very much so. And in lots of ways, you know, it's it's the same as lots of other uh, lots of other methodologies that would actually save the country money. If they were yeah. if they were properly introduced, I did um I did a thing about three two two and a half years ago now in at Boy in County Meath for the Leinster Fla and myself and two other music therapists and a dance ther a dance movement therapist. We did a week of workshops for people with special needs and an older age around the Fla, and we had fifty people. We had a, we had a different group every day for five days, and we had fifty we had fifty people every day. So we had over two hundred and fifty people coming in experiencing that you know, methodology and mo and moving away from it and then wanting more, you know, and yeah, only for the fact that that the people in that boy actually got the money together to be able to do it. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have been funded by anybody else. You know, it wouldn't have happened. So, yeah, yeah, that, that reminds me of the, the, the sense that culture and the arts are given a lot of kind of superficial lip service at the state level of how much we value our our arts and our culture, but when it comes to the rubber hitting the road, it's not always <laughs> the case. No, definitely not. No, 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 no. It's good. When it comes to putting the, the hand in the pocket, it's it's definitely not. And it's, uh, I suppose, I, I, I shouldn't be knocking anybody, but at the same time, it has been made so difficult to actually get funding for projects that you want to do. You know, mm. even, you know, even the Arts Council is like, it's, their application process is arcane, you know. It takes days and weeks for, you know, paltry amount of money. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a challenging dynamic, this whole, I mean, we could, we could do a whole episode on, on this subject alone, Tommy. Just, just, you know, livelihoods as well and the arts is, a, is another big topic. But I, I want to go back also and just touch on that interest in art therapy. And, and I wonder... Was there a particular moment or time in your life where you felt distinctly like the, the actual therapeutic benefits of music or was that just implicit the minute you, you got on that horse, you know? Gosh, I, I, I remember it quite distinctly. I, I, was, playing, I was playing with Lee Mufflin in the, and, and gosh, he's dead now, and Arthur McGlynn, who was also passed away in the last year, and Rob McVeigh and myself were playing in a band with Lee Mufflin's kind of Piper's Call band. And I did that for about three or four years, and we toured a lot, and especially in especially in northern Spain and places where Liam was very well known. And I remember going into UL for for some reason or other, I can't remember what it was, and I met Michal Sulvan, secretary, who was a friend of mine, and she and she said, yeah, and we were just chatting, we were having a cup of coffee, and she said, oh yeah, we just started a music therapy course, and it was like a a light bulb went off in my head. I said, what's that? It was my first was my first time. And then she explained a little bit, you know, she didn't know that much about it either. And I knew instantly this is that's what I wanted to do. There was no kind of well, I came home and talked to my wife about it, obviously, but mm -hmm. she, she was very supportive. But but uh, yeah, that was it. The, and, you know, within a, within three or four weeks, I wasn't touring anymore. I was actually, you know, within six months, I was sitting down studying books, which I hadn't done since I was seventeen. 
And was that, um, I mean, obviously it was a conscious decision, but you also, you know, it's a case where you can't have everything or do everything. So you had to let one part of your life sort of be still for a moment or... or oh yeah, for about 10 years. <laughs> well, yeah, more than a moment, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And was was there a sense of missing that or, or was it just so the benefit of the other so compelling? Well, it, it was so it was so all consuming. You know, the first the fact is it, it's for me who who'd barely scraped through my leaving search, well, all of a sudden I was doing a, a full time master's course. Okay. Which was really difficult for because the fact I hadn't been in school for nearly thirty years. And so was this your this your first, you know, in one sense could you say it's your first real shot at education in a meaningful sense oh very much so very yeah. much so yeah and going straight into a master's was was also very difficult you know uh, and writing writing essays i still hate writing but i mean you know that kind of thing all and yeah. having to having to learn new instruments you know i had to learn i had to learn guitar i had to learn piano i still can play the piano very well but my guitar playing is, is reasonable and I, you know i had all that i had all that to do plus write an average of 30 40 000 words a year so yeah it was quite a thing. And then getting set up, getting work, you know, all that kind of getting consumed by the work, um, which, you know, went on for quite a, quite a number of years. And then kind of starting to feel that the, the, I needed a balance, that I wasn't playing, not even performing, was well, just playing, well, I like performing anyway, I'm, I'm a bit of a ham. But, in, you know, just, just actual playing for myself was, was a thing that kind of came after, after a few years, yeah getting back into actually playing and performing and recording again with people. Yeah. And where where did music first enter your life in the early days, Tommy? You know, was Gosh. it, was it um, early childhood or teens or? It was, teen, it was late teens, actually. Um, well, I grew, I grew up in a village in, in West Limerick that had, I think, from my memory, no, no traditional music. There have been a, a few people who, who could play a couple of tunes. Um, but most, you know, it wasn't it was a musical thing. I had, I had an uncle who played the box for his his wife, who was a dance teacher. But you know, he he was all right. He wasn't. He wouldn't have been mad into playing. He'd play. He'd play for her when she needed it. And I think I had an uncle who played, or a grand uncle who played the flute. But that was about it. And there was there was nothing in the place. And it wasn't. I moved. I moved to England. I went to England when I was about eighteen or nineteen. I think I first of myself and this mate of mine decided we were going to hitchhike around Europe for a year. We lasted about four weeks and we got back to London and he he went back to Ireland and I stayed on and I got I got I got a job. I started working on, on, on the on the buildings as millions of others have done. And I have a I have a cousin who was married to a guy who played Appalachian Dulcimer, which is you know, a very strange instrument in in in, in thread circles, but he had a massive record collection. He was mad into traditional music. And through being down there and spending time with him and listening to his music, I suddenly got really interested. And I, I mean, other people talk about that, the fact that when you leave home, you get more interested in, your, in the music from your own culture. Uh, and Christy Moore talked about it a lot. And that's where I got, I got really interested in Irish music. And I came back and, <laughs> it's funny. Um, I, had, I, I had played the spoons when I was a kid. My, if someone taught me how to play the spoons, or I picked it up from somebody. And so I started, Doing that, playing spoons and with, with a banjo player who, who was married to a woman from from the local village, um, and he was he, from Kilkenny, and he was he was mad into Irish music, and uh, I was in I was in I was in Listowel in 1974, in a, in a in the back of a pub, and I'd never been that interested in playing baron or playing percussion, and I heard Johnny Ringo McDonough, who was the baron player with Dead Honor, and he completely bloomed the brains out of me. I couldn't believe somebody was doing what he was doing. On Boron, and I started. I started practicing, you know, on a book or a piece of timber or something. And no matter what I what I could do, and fun, I won the All Ireland the following year, <laughs> which is hard to believe. But I and I still kind of find it hard to believe myself. But I I was so into it that I spent. Someone gave me a, eventually gave me a drum, and I spent hours, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours a day just playing and not doing anything else. And yeah, and then from there. I went back and I won the All Ireland the following year because I didn't quite believe it the first time, and the following year I was full time on the road with a band. <laughs> you know? wow, wow. <laughs> it's a mad story. <laughs> yeah, 
It goes yeah. to show you though, doesn't it? it go, if, if, if somebody finds their tool or their instrument or yeah. their, their yeah. groove, and I, I think that's where um, the right form of education can be life-changing, you know? Yeah, very much so. And I mean, I see, I see now, I mean, I'm not too far away from Tulla. And if you're a teenager in Tulla and you don't play the concertina, you're not cool. <laughs> when I think back to when I think back to when I I think the first time I won the and uh, the All Ireland, I think one person in the village congratulated me. Nobody took any notice of it. It wasn't it wasn't the thing to do. And I and I talked. I remember talking to a lot of my contemporaries who would have said the same thing. They'd be hiding the instrument when they when they'd be gone. You know, gone for lessons after school. Amazing. Uh, and, yeah, and, isn't it? And when we talk about Tulla, do you, can you attribute that to like a long-standing tradition, or was it more like is it is it more an active kind of conscious cultivation that's going on there? It's yeah, it's very well, especially in Mary McNamara, the concertina player would be the one who who you know she sat as a school in, in Tulla. She teaches I don't know how many kids a week. It must be one hundred and fifty, you know. And it's you know yeah, and the amount of amazing amazing kids musicians out there these days it's, yeah. it's incredible it's wonderful it makes me think also the role that mary's playing there you know that she's teaching potentially over the course of her life thousands of musicians yes and and they in turn will go on to not all of them perhaps but but a lot of them will go on to share thousands of songs to tens of thousands of people it's yes very much so it's, it's quite extraordinary isn't it yeah, yeah. um and i remember i, I sat in because one, one of my young fellows was playing box for a while so I, I i'd sit in and listen to her teaching and i loved the way she she taught she she'd teach the tune and she'd teach the way and then she'd make them think about what the what the composer was thinking about when he when he wrote it you know it's such a such a lovely way of of of, of connecting connecting them to the music you know? yeah again yeah. a different way of learning you know I, I i feel like i would have learned a lot of my own um interest in society and culture and everything else through lyrics and folk music and and the the messages that were being conveyed through folk music more so than the messages in academic textbooks you know oh yeah and then that yeah that acts as a portal then that you might go and read the academic textbook after that you know yeah 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 very much so yeah yeah um so so you know you, you had your your kind of wild times in the early days in claire and then you know claire obviously got a hold of you whereby you decide to break for the border and not return <laughs> well um, no I, I i did i did have a, i did have a few detours detours in between oh, I, did. Uh, I, I i lived in america for, i lived in america for 10 years um i i i i left stockton's ring in I think it was 1983, and I started playing with a jazz flautist in Dublin, a fellow called Brian Dunning. And he moved to the States, and I, I kind of ended up moving as well. We, we were based in Portland, Oregon for quite a number of years, and we had a band there, and we recorded a couple of albums and toured and various other things. And then I met my wife <coughs> there, and we came, we came back to Ireland in, in, the late, in the late 80s. So, yeah, and then from there to starting seed savers and to move into Clare. So the, the whole the whole move back to Clare was probably what year will it have been? About twenty five years twenty five years ago. Yeah, we'd have started seed savers in Carlow and then moved it to Clare. And yeah. like Oregon's a pretty amazing part of the world. I'm just wondering, you know, what was the um what was the push or the pull that decided not Portland but but Clare? Um Children. <laughs> Going back to Ireland was definitely having kids. Didn't feel like America was a place to bring up a child. Um, and we, we both felt that. So that was kind of one of the main reasons. <clears throat> uh, and and realising how, I think, realising how lonesome I was for the place as well. Mm. Uh, it's really fascinating. I, I remember there was a, um, we, we'd moved, we were living in Olympia, Washington, and uh, there was a, a local film festival on, and I went to a lot of movies. And the very last one was 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 The Dead. Was um, what's his who produced? I can't remember the name. Who, who produced it? But uh, there was there was there was a scene of Connemara at the very end of it. And I remember I was I was in tears. I just mm. I needed I needed to get back here, you know. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of gets it gets into your bones this place. And then uh, talk to me about your uh, wife, Anita, because she's, she's sort of well known in her own regard and, and we could, you know, she's worthy of her own 
episode and interview but you, 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 you'll have some job getting her to do that i'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> not, a, not a huge fan of the limelight at all yeah yeah, yeah well yeah. All, the, all the more reason maybe to to big her up for a minute but um can, can you tell uh, listeners and viewers um just a little bit about her God, well, well, I met her. I met her in. I was playing in Murphy's in Seattle, Murphy's Bar in Seattle one night, with the Ben Puck Fair, and a friend of hers told her she had to go see this drummer. And here, here I am, thirty-five years later. Um, yeah, so she she was she was she was she she's from Ohio originally, and then moved to the West Coast, California, Seattle, um, got a Got a degree in horticulture in in Washington in Olympia, Washington, and Evergreen State College, and got really interested in seed saving. Came back here, had numerous careers before, prior to that. Um, came, when we came back here, she just looked around and said, "No, there's nobody. There's nobody. We were very very inspired by the by the, the crowd in America, in Iowa, the American seed savers. And when we got back here, just there was no there was no organisation, there was nobody doing it. So she said, "Right, I'm going to start it." So I kind of said, fair enough, not realizing <laughs> what was going to, what the monster it was going to turn into. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of, yeah. 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 yeah she, and she, she hates the limelight. She can she really doesn't, it's not her thing at all. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. a lot of the best, a lot of the best people do, you know, and um, yeah. the kind of quiet leader figures, there's an assumption yeah. that, um, an assumption that leaders are all look a certain way and sound a certain way and tend to be loud and proud and all that but yeah no the more no, effective think... ones are in the background quiet yeah mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> and i think i think i mean the thing that's really come to me over the years of being so involved with seed savers is the fact that what i, what I really like about about organizations like that is that they actually do the work they don't pow on the streets even out about it, they actually, you know, sit down and, and do stuff, you know, find find old varieties of food, you know, as what as what happened in Seed Savers. Fine. She travelled around for years finding old varieties of apple, you know. That's why we have that collection there. And it, I think it's I guess, you know, it's it's a it's a very different way of being an activist. Yeah. Well it, it's <laughs> constructive for a start. Yeah. 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 Or an active activist as I call them yeah. sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. Tommy, like, you know, for, for a lot of people that maybe they know a tiny bit about what seed saving is or food sovereignty or seed sovereignty and all this kind of thing. But for those that maybe don't, can you give just an overarching sense of what it is and why it, why it matters? <laughs> well, it's the, the seeds of the bedrock of food. You know, if, without seeds, you have no food. And we have lost close to 90% of, of, our, of our seed crop in the last 100 years. You know, at the moment, there are, I think there's maybe four varieties of wheat that are being grown monoculturally around the world for, for all the bread we eat. Um, when where there would have been hundreds, there would have been thousands. Um, we buy three varieties of apple, none of them Irish. They're all imported. Gala is from New Zealand. Um, I think for the ladies, which I really have an objection to. I don't know where they're from. I think I think they're South African. You know, Golden Delicious would be the closest, and they they wouldn't even be grown here that much. You know, so um, you know, we're 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 heavily reliant on imported food. We're heavily reliant on seeds that don't oftentimes grow that well in this climate. And um, as the men said, there's only three days supply of food in the supermarkets. <laughs> you know, uh, so. If, if you don't have if you don't have that bedrock that foundation that you can grow on well then you have nothing mm -hmm. and we have lost so much I mean seed savers now at the moment starting off from a base of practically nothing there's 190 different varieties of Irish apple which you know you will never see in a shop there's over a thousand varieties of food of food crops which you will again rarely see in a shop unless you grow it yourself you know and so yeah we've we've come to and a lot of it's got to do with rules and regulations and EU laws and companies pushing for the, you know, I mean, there's, there's, the, some of the biggest companies in the world are seed companies. Some of, some of the biggest, the richest companies in the world are seed companies. So how on earth has, has it been allowed to get to become that, you know? So, so, what, so what we do is we grow, we grow food and we save seeds. 
and we keep them in a we have a gene bank in Scarif and they're kept in there. I mean we're not as we're not as involved now as we used to be. <laughs> All, you know, but we're still we still are involved. And there's there's a there's twenty acres and there's a really there's a really dynamic workforce there. We do amazing work. And yeah, it's an amazing place. Anyone anyone should go visit it if they get a chance. If we ever get out of this lockdown. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep keep the lockdown out of the conversation. We're, we're all getting a bit fed up of it, but um, Absolutely. like I suppose maybe we'll we'll talk as to you know the importance of live music is probably additionally important for me anyway. Reflecting on it and the absence of live music during these COVID times, where I've I personally feel like an additional value or you know something you may have taken for granted and. Uh, you as a performer, how is how do you feel about that? And are you? Oh God, that's been really difficult. I mean, I haven't I haven't done a gig. I've done one gig since the lockdown started. We did we did a gig in a in a in a yoga centre, socially distanced. With, I think there was twenty people in there. That's the only thing I've done. I've done a few things online, but yeah, you really you really miss it. You know, there's that there's that connection between you between you and an audience that you know it doesn't happen on, on a on a screen, it really doesn't. You know, this, yeah. uh, the flow, the flow of information, the flow of words, the flow of music, yeah. doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. And and the vibe in the room as well, where people feel uplifted and connected and warm and energized. Yeah, yeah. and and talking to people they might they might never have seen met before, but they're all they're all joined up by that common that common thing where they're where they're you know t- taking part in a, in an actual event. You know, and it's, it's not just a musician on the stage. I think there's that flow, that, that backwards and forwards flow between audience, audience and performer that you can't really replicate, you know, anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, my, well, my hope is that, you know, when, when we get at it again, it'll be with gusto. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, yeah, and I think, I think also, I hope that people actually might realise the value of it more. That would be that would be my my think on it because it's it's a very special thing going to going to you know I and I don't get to go go to many gigs as like as per, per most performers, you know you you there's a gig on that you want to go to and all of a sudden you have a gig yourself so you're not you're not going to be able to make it you know mm. and but I do I do really appreciate it when I do go to see somebody. And hear them and get that experience, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of too young to to remember, but, but all the talk of the iconic, legendary folk clubs and so on, and there, there should be no reason that every town in Ireland or every town in the world shouldn't have thriving live music, as we use the but, language now of essential services, you know. But you know what I mean? It's really funny. Um, I mean, I, I, I've toured, I've, I've toured a lot, of, you know, around the world, and I, I remember, I, how many years ago? I can't remember. I was doing a gig with Martin O'Connor and a couple of lads. We were, in, we were at this huge folk festival in France, and before the gig, we had a press conference with about twenty-five journalists, and I'm looking around. I mean, I, and I'd seen it many times before, but it just really struck me that there was no way I would ever get to do that here. Before a gig or before a festival, it wouldn't be. It's not part. Of, it's not part of the thinking here. And even even and even as close as somewhere as Belfast is as a thriving music kind of journalist scene, the, where all the papers would have would have a, a, you know, a thing about live and about live traditional music. And it's not it's not valued as much as here as it would be outside of here, which I always find really fascinating. Maybe maybe we take it for granted because there's so much of it now. But even when we didn't, it wasn't that valued, you know. Mm. So, yeah, no, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I hope doesn't. I hope there'll be yeah, a bit more value for it. Yeah. And and then on the other hand, like the, there does seem to be lots of signs of hope. With particularly when you talk about the amount of young people that are are studying and practicing. Um, are you seeing that? As a, a local or a national phenomenon, I know it's. Oh, it's I, I think it's more, it's more of a national thing, especially well, especially on the west. And I think the Irish World Academy has had an awful lot to do with it. UCC has had an amazing amount to do with it. 
So the fact the fact that it's moving into that academic way of being um, gives it more value, gives, yeah. and gives it more and, gi- and gives it more value to to other people that see it as having more value. So it's, it's it's got to do with perception as well. Where whereas before Asher, he's only going to the pub to play a few tunes. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, oh, he's got a PhD in fucking, <laughs> you know, in accordion players of the nineteen fifties. <laughs> you know, or like Steve Cooney just got his one on this system of um, um, rhythm notation that he's developed. You know, mm. so it's just yeah, yeah, yeah. So that gives it that does give it a lot more value. Yeah. And um, I'm just you know we're we're obviously both in in Clare and on separate sides of the county, if you like. But um, like Clare is for a long time held a special place in, in the national or even the global imagination when it comes to music, hasn't it? Oh yeah, extremely, yeah, very much so. I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's one of the pockets. You know, there, there are pockets, you know, just like, there's a Roscommon pocket, there's a Clare pocket, there's a Donegal pocket, there's a Kerry pocket, you know, there's a Waterford one. So it's one of those kind of bearers, I wouldn't call it a bearer of tradition, but a holder of tradition, very much so, mm. yeah. You know, the amount of extraordinary musicians that have come out of Clare down, down through the years, you know, it's, it's amazing. Even just around here, it's amazing. You know, some of the older players were you know, extraordinary players. Yeah. I mean, what, what can you say? <coughs> yeah. Do you, do you feel like, do you feel that that's in, in good health as well? That the, the, the stature of Clare, Clare's kind of stature in that regard? I suppose, I probably, it's, I, it probably is. It probably is. It's still, I mean, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be that au, au fait with statues or stuff like that. I mean, yeah. a, a, lot, a lot of the time when I'm, when I'm doing stuff, you know, I'm doing a gig or I'm doing a project. I'm, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a pub player. I don't, I don't do pubs or once or twice a year maybe. But other than that, yeah, I think it's still held in very high regard. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we've talked a fair bit about, um, you know, the therapeutic aspects and, and how it can really help people at, at a, a different level. And you might say like an emotional level as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm just wondering what for you often hear this kind of term from people that maybe they don't think of themselves as creative or artistic or that they don't feel that they have any music or anything to offer or express in that area. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know. I think I think they're kind of devaluing themselves in that way. I don't. I think you know, there's a spark of creativity in all of us. Some of us, some of us are lucky enough to be able to develop that spark and develop it into a life skill or into or, or into you know in, in, into a, a job. But I think there's a spark in all of us. I, I, we all have our own creativity, you know, as as you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I I I play com- I com- I play competitive Scrabble. I mean, on a, you know, a fa- fairly fairly intense level. And I find you know go go and hang it out with those guys, which I don't get to do very often. But at the same time, you can see you can see that huge well of creativity in that. Yeah, as well. You know, so I know I think everybody has everybody has a hint of it. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. we're just some of us are lucky enough to be able to work with it. And, yeah, and, yeah. and to have had the time, you know, over, you know, 30, 40, 50 years to develop it, you know, and lucky enough to be able to scrape a living out of it and keep going. And, and, and so I suppose have that, that need to do it. I mean, I think it's, it's a question of need as well. You know, it's sometimes with creativity, you don't have a choice. You just have to do it, you know. And don't ask me where that comes from because I haven't a clue. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me want to ask you now. But I, I tell you what I will ask you. I never heard of compat- competitive Scrabble or before. I never heard of that. Uh, what goes on there? Like, is Where does that happen? Is it online? Um, a lot of it happens down in the southeast. Um, it happens all over the world. I mean, there's world, the World Championships last year were in Goa and in India. Um, and you know the prize money was rather large. You can, you can, you know, there are there are people who kind of can make a living out of playing Scrabble. And, and yeah. what level would you be at now without you know? <laughs> <laughs> Me, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Have you ever played Scrabble? 
Yeah, but yeah. No, no level worth mentioning. But yeah, well, like you know, you'd be up to five or six hundred points in a game. Yeah. Where some, you know, normally in order game would be a hundred points or two hundred type of thing. So you'd be up in the four or five hundreds type of thing. Yeah. And even then, some of the top players in the world would be up in the nine hundreds and the thousands. Yeah. In a game, and so it's yeah, it's quite a thing actually. It's quite amazing. You have to memorize all the two letter words in the in the in the dictionary and all, most of the three letter words. Yeah. And, does, and go does, from there. Does the Scrabble not get in the way of the music? <laughs> not really, though. No, 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 no. There's a club. We have a club in Scarif and we play every Monday. Well, we haven't done now. Again, I won't mention the L word. Um, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we go to competitions and things as well. I'm imagining, so I'm imagining it's um, of additional benefit for kind of you know neurological health and all oh, yeah. that as well yeah yeah well i'm not i'm not a young fella anymore so you know it's it 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 does it does it does help it keeps the brain fairly active yeah, yeah. no i was um i was at a conference on dementia um last year and i learned a fair bit about dementia at that not enough but you know it really shocked me the levels of dementia in society and how we don't know about it and how we mm-hmm. kind of need to do more but just got me thinking things like not just scrabble but like certainly music and how music is part of can really assist with dementia oh very much so yeah i mean i've i've worked in, i haven't worked in dementia for a long time but i have worked in dementia over the years and people who have lost every facility still have the still still can, can still sing they have the ability to sing and remember and remember songs which is quite but it's a different side of the brain obviously but um yeah you know music music is really important in dementia work yeah, actually, cultists have just done a big uh, study where they're using. Uh, there's a fiddle player in the north, a music therapist called jo- Josie Nugent from Clare, actually, uh, who's who's done a set up a whole dementia uh, trad music appreciation groups for dementia groups in England. Yeah, I'm just reading about it the other day. Really interesting stuff. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I, I think it's fair to say we're 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 fairly agreed on the fact that you know, the full benefits of music aren't being reaped. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hugely. Hugely. Um, um, I mean, it's something we all do. It's something we all do unconsciously. We sing, we hum, babies hum. Music is, music is just intrinsically in part of our lives. Yeah. Um, yeah. Some of us have been lucky enough to, to, to do it for a living. But in lots of ways, it's, it's a connection. You can, you, can, you, can, you can make that connection and with with somebody through music that you can't make in any other way yeah so tommy um it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and oh, um, you. i look forward to maybe seeing you in the flesh and seeing you do some <laughs> some scrabble and some <laughs> making some making some music <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 well, yeah. Well, unless you want to go to a, a, a three-day tournament and play twenty-seven games over three days, I'll tell you. No, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll skip that. <laughs> Touch I'll, I'll go for the gig instead. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, fair enough. Yeah. No, thanks very much, Tommy. Appreciate right. your time. No problem. No problem. Enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.